Everybody was terrified of this week. And honestly, I loved it, ladies and gentlemen. I thought that there were a lot of guys that went out there, performed well, happy to see breakouts from guys like Jonathan Taylor. Now, there are some injuries we need to talk about. There are a few disappointing players, Bijan Robinson, Aaron Jones, of course, that we will bring up. But let's start it off with the Ravens game, where the Ravens go out there and boat race the Detroit Lions. They're never in this game whatsoever. In Baltimore, Lamar Jackson shows why he was our most invested into player in underdog drafts this year. Let me flex on y'all real quick. No money spent on any other player more than Lamar Jackson this season. Lamar gets you the rushing touchdown, which we love. Also has 357 passing yards and three touchdowns go along with it. Mark Andrews has himself a day. Flowers doesn't really blow up, but Zay Flowers still has six targets. Interesting to see Odell getting involved a little bit more here. Bateman was getting involved early on. Bateman fizzled out. Bateman's still not worth the roster spot. The biggest takeaway that we will have here in Baltimore is Keaton Mitchell still doesn't have a role. I, I don't know who told y'all to get Keaton. I don't know what's going on with Keaton Mitchell. Why are y'all rostering this bum? Let him go. I probably shouldn't be that harsh now that I said that, Keaton Mitchell. Next week, we'll go out there and have 20 carries and 100 rushing yards. But nonetheless, still split backfield between Edwards, Justice Hill. They both see 30 snaps compared to Keaton Mitchell at two. Gus Edwards gets the majority of the work. He has 14 carries. And Gus Edwards, the man that just simply does not catch the ball, gets you an 80-yard reception as well. Actually leads the team in receiving, funny enough. Uh, still don't think Edwards, still don't think Justice Hill or that appealing out running back. I mean, really, nothing's going to change too much here. You still start Lamar every single week. You still start Andrews every single week. And you still start Zay Flowers every single week. Maybe we can just say cut Keaton Mitchell if you are one of the people rostering him. Now, going over to Detroit, Jared Goff obviously kind of failed. I mean, without David Montgomery here, maybe this offense just having a hard time running. I don't want to act like this would have been a game even with David Montgomery. Primary thing that we have to look at is going to be the usage that you had from Jameer Gibbs. Keep in mind, Craig Reynolds was not fully healthy, but they utilize Gibbs as a three-down workhorse. Jameer Gibbs, 65 snaps out of a potential 75. Jameer Gibbs sees 10 targets. He has nine receptions. He has 11 carries, goes over 100 total yards, and gets you that touchdown as well. Now, we did talk about this earlier in the season, saying that the weeks where you would want David Montgomery would be the weeks where the Detroit Lions are leading the majority of the game, and the weeks that you'd want Jameer Gibbs is if they are trailing and they are going to be forced to throw the ball. That's exactly what we saw in this game. Amon Ross St. Brown had 19 targets. Obviously, when you're trailing the entire game and Goff's going to have 53 passing attempts, things are going to get out of hand. One quick side note, Jamison Williams looks like someone that you can just possibly go ahead and, I don't want to say cut, he had six targets. Roster Jamison still, but he is right there on the chopping block. He gives you the goose egg. Now, going over to Chicago, <sighs> lot to talk about here. Justin Fields has a quarterback record of like 6-27 and 27 for his NFL career. His largest win ever was 20 points. And that was against the Commanders a few weeks back. In his first game ever, someone that I didn't even know how to pronounce his name coming into this. We were calling him Tyson Baggett or Bagant. I, I had no idea. Goes out and actually wins the game. Deonta Foreman is that running back that obviously is a must-start guy any week. You have no Roshan Johnson. He gets the three touchdowns. Now, hopefully you started Foreman this week going forward. I don't necessarily think that it's going to be a spot where we can be super, super excited about Deonta Foreman when you get Roshan back in. I think it'll be more so running back by committee. And yeah, we talked about still starting DJ Moore in this game simply because if you looked at the historical averages, what you had with Justin Fields, Justin Fields through his NFL career has averaged about one passing touchdown a game and 160 passing yards a game. So removing Fields from this offense doesn't necessarily have a negative impact on the receivers here. DJ Moore still had nine targets, still had eight receptions, 80, I mean, 54 receiving yards. So I think everything's going to stay the same. The only difference is if you have no Justin Fields, you do not start a quarterback because you don't have the rushing QB upside. Now, going over to the Raiders side of things, we actually had Devontae Adams as that buy low candidate this week. And I was really excited in the first quarter. I was like, oh my God, I can't wait for the video tonight. Can't wait to come out here and say, I told you so. I told you. He still had an okay game. He had 12 targets. He did lead the team in receiving with 57 receiving yards. The man dropped a easy touchdown in the red zone. Should have been his 
blew past the defender with the fade, put a move on him, had, I mean, I want to say four yards of separation at the minimum, hit his hands and hit the turf. Very, very disappointing. Still did fine, but I don't know. Maybe the days of him being a wide receiver one are over, even if we want to assume that they aren't. And then Jacoby Myers has himself a day. What we had seen so far this year is if you have Jimmy G playing, Myers is exciting. With no Jimmy G, Myers isn't someone we can rely on. So it's very interesting to see him go out there and have 13 targets, seven receptions, 50 receiving yards, and the receiving touchdown. This was a blowout, so I don't want to take too much away from the running back usage, but they did steer clear of Jacobs. Jacobs only had 43 snaps out of a potential 65, and Jacobs did have a drop pass that led to a disaster. So, I mean, Jacobs did not play well. I don't want to assume that he's playing himself out of a job right away just because ultimately at the end of the day this game was that blowout now going over to the game that i honestly think was the most surprising and weirdest game of the week we are gonna have cleveland indianapolis now y'all know last week the cleveland browns completely shut down the 49ers they shut down brock purdy now with brock purdy don't expect that to happen on monday night we actually have a new customer offer on underdog fantasy more than less than half a passing yard for Brock Purdy if you use code FLOCK. Code FLOCK also going to get you a 100% deposit match and our rest of season fantasy football rankings and tiers. And on top of that, ladies and gentlemen, because so many of y'all use promo code FLOCK on Underdog last week, this week they are hooking everybody up with code FLOCK with an Amon Ross St. Brown special pick em as well. More than less than half a total yard. On top of that, Brock Purdy won. And to celebrate NBA tip off, they actually have a LeBron James special pick of more than less than half a total point. Three special pick ups the same week. Literally never happens. Please make sure you're going to take advantage only with Code Flock. But going over to what the Browns defense did this week, they let up everything. I mean, you have Jonathan the Taylor going out there. Thank God I jotted the Taylor on so many teams this week. Gets the 18 carries, 75 rushing yards, rushing touchdown. Jonathan Taylor does Taylor things well, 45 receiving yards and three receptions. So Jonathan Taylor in a brutal matchup goes out there and drops 20 points for you. And you know, I have Taylor everywhere. We've been screaming to buy low on Jonathan Taylor. I will say it's not all good here. I was expecting at this point, Taylor to be leading the backfield. I was expecting this to be a 60-40 split. Whereas you did have Zag Moss seeing 35 snaps, the same amount as Taylor which is a little frustrating. I'm hoping that we continue to get more and more Taylor, but until then, it's hard to assume that Taylor's going to be that high-end RB1 in fantasy. You have both Michael Pittman and Josh Downs get in there, our second and third most drafted wide receivers on underdog this year. It's flex again. Great week. And you know I'm going to take my L's where we need to. But nonetheless, they go out there, they get there in a very tough matchup. Didn't expect Downs to be able to do it, but Downs got there immediately with the 59-yard receiving touchdown. Michael Pittman Jr. took a little bit of time with the 75 receiving yard touchdown. Going over to the Brown side of things, super weird game where Deshaun Watson goes down after five attempts, gives you a whopping five passing yards, zero touchdowns, and an interception. Has a QBR of 0.3. And then P.J. Walker comes in. P.J. Walker's not any good either. I think everybody understands that. But the team effectively runs the ball. You have Jerome Ford breaking off a 69-yard rushing touchdown. Now, Ford does go down with the ankle injury, and that's going to be something to monitor. And if Ford misses any time, Kareem Hunt will be a must-start running back. We have a lot of Kareem Hunt. Very excited about it. But nonetheless, with Hunt, I will be a little bit honest. He's still probably going to split the backfield with Pierre Strong. He really didn't have any involvement as a receiver this week. We had one target for zero receptions. So while I would love to come out here and I would love to say, oh yeah, Kareem Hunt is going to be a top 10 running back. And realistically, he's probably going to be a high-end RB2, mid-RB2. Now going over to the Patriots game, maybe this is the most surprising game. I don't know. This is a game where you have Mac Jones not looking horrendous. Mac Jones actually goes out there, 25 completions off of 30 in tips and two passing touchdowns. Now, Ramondre and Zeke Elliott still split the backfield. Zeke comes away with the rushing touchdown and more carries. Ramondre Stevenson saves his day from a PPR perspective with the six receptions. Regardless, I don't think you're excited about either running back here going forward. Kendrick Bourne gets there with the seven targets. I mean, I don't necessarily know if Kendrick Bourne's going to be inside our top 30 wide receiver rankings this week. We talked about him on the waiver wire video this week, though, saying probably someone that you had to pick up just given how bad, I mean, bye weeks and injuries were. Now, the main takeaway that we're going to have from this Patriots offense is it's time to cut Hunter Henry. If you look at this graph from PFF, all this snap data, all these graphs are from PFF. 
you will see that Hunter Henry is actually on that straight decline with his snaps played. He almost had a touchdown this week, but ultimately actually only played 30 snaps compared to Mike Kosecki at 30. Now going over to the Buffalo side of things, the main thing that we wanted to look at is what was the running back usage with no Damian Harris? Because Damian Harris on the IR are going to miss a considerable amount of time now. You have James Cook with 13 carries, 56 rushing yards. You have Latavius Murray with only four carries. You have James Cook with the three targets out of the backfield as well. Cook's the clear lead back. I mean, this is good news as obviously going into the game, James Cook was kind of waning with his overall usage. So it looks like James Cook definitely must start running back any week that you have no Damian Harris. And then in terms of what we're getting from the receivers, the Dalton Kincaid breakout is here. Dalton Kincaid, eight targets, 75 receiving yards, leads the team in receiving. And yeah, Dawson Knox, I don't want to say being completely phased out, Dawson Knox still plays more snaps, but Dalton Kincaid runs more routes. And then obviously you don't draft Dalton Kincaid in round one to use Dawson Knox. Now, going over the Giants game, Darren Baller looks good. And we talked about this this week, about how bad the commander's secondary is. And, okay, well, if Darren Baller is more so used as a receiver, maybe this is a Darren Baller game. So, honestly, maybe this is a little more matchup than anything. Don't think this offense is good going forward. Saquon Barkley, three down back, plays 57 out of 68 snaps. Barkley gets his four targets out of the backfield, has his 21 carries. So, we'll be a must-start guy every single week, regardless how bad this offense and offensive line is. The offensive line should get better next week. I guess the offense should be better with Daniel Jones as well. Going over to the Washington side, Brian Robinson's usage is actually going down. We had Brian Robinson as a must-start player this week. Got extremely lucky for him to have the rushing touchdown. You actually had seven carries from Chris Rodriguez. You had two from Antonio Gibson. And Brian Robinson's overall usage as a receiver completely falls off, only gets you one target out of this backfield this week. So, yeah, I mean, I think Brian Robinson, we had him ranked as that mid-RB2. Instead, I think we're probably going to have to be looking at him as a high-end RB3, assuming he's good to go. Now, the saddest thing of the week. Despite no injury report coming into the game, despite with radio silence coming from Atlanta about Bijan Robinson, Bijan Robinson, the quote is, it started last night. I was feeling weird. I woke up just completely out of it. I tried to take medicine so I could be good for the game, but my head was hurting bad. I don't know what's going on. I tried to go in pregame, but when coach said, we'll be all right, let's get you right. Sucks. He wasn't on the injury report. I'm assuming you'll be good to go next week. Now, the real question is how much of this story is exaggerated? How much of this is true? I'm going to operate under the assumption that this is a true story, that B. John Robinson did just have some type of headache. I don't know. Obviously, very frustrating. I mean, going over to the receivers, Kyle Pitts makes one hell of a grab. But if you look at the usage with Kyle Pitts, I mean, it's actually kind of going downwards. Where Pitts this week, 34 snaps out of 65, runs 21 out of potential 28 routes. So yeah, I mean, if you're going to be splitting that tight end room with Jonu, even if I drafted a lot of you, can't lie, you're not that exciting. Now, going over to Tampa, pretty much there's not a lot to talk about. Rashad White continues to dominate. 55 snaps compared to Keyshawn Vaughn at 18. Rashad White continues to be laughably inefficient with a whopping 2.6 yards per carry, but he gets there in a full BBR format with the receiving volume. He does have six receptions out of this backfield, which obviously does save him in a way. And then Godwin has 12 targets. Evans has eight, as we've seen all season now. Mike Evans just continues to be significantly more efficient with the targets that he sees versus Chris Godwin, which continues to surprise me, right? Because I naturally, I would assume Evans going into year nine of his NFL career, it's uh, where I would assume we get the efficiency drop off rather than Chris Godwin, who supposedly, I mean, should be stepping into his prime at this point. But maybe Baker just likes Evans more. Now, going over to Pittsburgh, you have Deontay Johnson back in. You have eight targets for George Pickens, six targets for Deontay. You have no bad for even though what's very impressive is just everything's funneled to these two players. 14 targets for the combination of those two options, whereas you have only 23 total targets in this offense. So almost a 50% or over 50% team target share between Pickens and Deontay Johnson. Najee, Jalen Warren, both split the backfield when it comes to snaps. Still a 50-50 backfield split. We're not too excited about either guy. Now going over to the Rams, y'all know we had Puka as a buy low candidate coming off of last week. Saying, okay, well, even if I didn't love this guy at the beginning of the season, he's still a must-start player every single week with Cooper Cup and Puka. 
actually surprises me. He leads the team in receiving. Puka, 154 receiving yards. Cooper Cup gets to the whopping 29. Cup runs more routes, plays more snaps. It's not like you can blame an injury here. Obviously, I'm not projecting out Puka to be the wide receiver one rest of the season, but still, nonetheless, it is very interesting to see this in the first place. The main thing that we want to be looking at, of course, will be the running back usage. You have Daryl Henderson getting the majority of the snaps, 39 compared to 29 with Royce Freeman. You have Daryl Henderson seeing 18 carries compared to Royce Freeman at 12. We'll talk about both these guys more with the waiver wire video tomorrow, so just make sure that you are subscribed. But definitely looks like you can cut Zach Evans. I would honestly probably roster both these players with Daryl Henderson be the guy you're more excited about. Now, going over to the Chiefs, let me see if the snap data has come out from PFF yet regarding what we have with the receivers. Because I drafted a ton of Rasheed Rice this year, and in our best ball drafts, he's really helping out. But I honestly didn't think Rasheed Rice was going to be someone we could confidently go through and start. And he has six targets, but continues to get there with efficiency. I mean, the man has 60 receiving yards, five receptions, and the receiving touchdown. I'm going to be interested to see the snaps because, honestly, if he still plays fewer than 50% of the snaps and runs fewer than 50% of the routes like he has done over the past few weeks, I personally am probably going to say, okay, well, let's go ahead and let's bench him. Like It's super painful to do, but I don't know if this efficiency can keep up. Hopefully, what happened, we'll see with the snap data coming out that he played closer to 75% of the snaps. And if that's the case, then Rice looks like a must-start guy going forward. I mean, Pacheco doesn't really do much as a rusher, but is actually getting involved as a receiver, has the receiving touchdown as well. You have Kelsey absolutely dominating, but that doesn't change anything. Going over to the Chargers, what's very surprising here is you have Kelly, for whatever reason, deciding to be a viable running back in games where Austin Eckler plays. It's like, oh, okay, Eckler misses. Let's start Joshua Kelly. I guess he's going to be productive in fantasy. Does zip, does not, it does nothing. When you get Eckler in here, I guess it motivates the man. And he goes out there and just scores touchdowns on everybody's benches, steals them from Austin Eckler. You have the seven carries, 75 rushing yards in the rushing touchdown for Joshua Kelly. With Eckler, what is the most surprising, what is the most concerning in a way, is you have a whopping two targets. So, I mean, the top two running backs outside of CMC with Eckler and Bijan, at least who we thought were going to be coming into the week. Give you legitimately nothing. Palmer looks great. Leads the team in receiving. Keenan Allen doesn't really do much, but he has nine targets. Not worried about Keenan going forward. Now, going over to Arizona, I don't want to take too much away from the receivers here. I mean, I know everybody was mad at us for being too low on Hollywood Brown. Congrats on your three receptions for 49 receiving yards. But I will say, going to be much better, obviously, when we get Kyle Murray back in a few weeks. Now, the main thing is looking at the running back usage. I didn't think that Dermacotta was a, a must-start running back. I thought it was maybe Keonting. I, I have no idea what the hell's going on here, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, it looks like Dermacotta is right back to being that guy that you want to not only roster, but start. He has 53 out of 66 snaps. He gets you the 13 carries. He has five targets out of the backfield as well. Keonta Ingram is a non-factor, so I don't know. I don't know. Now, going over to Seattle, you had no DK Metcalf in this game, so what you end up getting is Jackson Smith and Jigba, and you would assume Tyler Lockett, but instead Jake Bobo, no idea who the hell that is, going out, scoring touchdowns. Love Jason. Y'all know he's been a buy-low guy for us over the past few weeks. Kenneth Walker gets absolutely everything. You had no Zach Charbonnet. Don't make a big deal of like, oh, Walker, I guess, is uh, the number one running or number two running back in fantasy going forward. Look at his overall usage trend. No, in reality, like I said, this is primarily fueled off the no Zach Charbonnet in this offense. Nonetheless, you know, I do like Kenneth Walker, but I mean, I think we just have to be realistic here and say, okay, well, when you get Zach Charbonnet back in, when we eventually get DK Metcalf back in, this offense is probably going to go back to being closer to what it was. I do want to say that at this point, maybe Jackson Smith and Jigba is kind of taking that target share from Tyler Lockett, though, which is what we were hoping for. Now, going over to the Denver game, I was pumped about Aaron Jones. I was going, oh my gosh, the Denver Broncos are allowing 45 points per game to opposing running backs so far this season. Obviously, a lot of that being skewed with the Miami guys. But nonetheless, they're still... The worst defense in the NFL, allowing 17 to the Raiders, 35 to the Commanders, 70 to the Dolphins, 28 to the Bears, 31 to the Jets, 19 to the Chiefs. The Packers don't do anything. 
Jordan Love just officially looks like he's not that guy. I, I was excited about Christian Watson, but ultimately they spread this ball out everywhere. There are one, two, three, four different players that see five targets in this offense. Aaron Jones doesn't have a large role whatsoever. I assume it's because the Aaron Jones injury. Regardless, until we see otherwise, I don't necessarily know if anybody's startable in Green Bay. And y'all know, I, I mean, I'm a Christian Watson guy. I was excited about Watson coming into the season. I was excited about Watson getting fully healthy. But yeah, if this offense is this bad, I mean, I don't know what's going to happen. Now, going over to Denver, Javante does look like he takes over the backfield, which is very interesting. I mean, Javante does have, I believe, 31 snaps. This is compared to Jaleel at 10, cut Jaleel, Samaj P. Ryan at 15. So still kind of a three-man running back by committee, but Javante's getting about 50% of it. He has the 15 carries. He has four targets out of the backfield as well. I mean, Sutton, Judy, both kind of get there. Sutton has the receiving touchdown. I don't think a lot changes in this Denver Broncos offense. I think the primary thing is you probably just want to be cutting Jaleel if you have him. But I think that's all I have for y'all in this video. If you have not done so already, go down there, hit that like button, subscribe to the channel if you play fantasy football. And if you wanted to go through and check out any of those pickums for Monday night's game, you can find that link in the description and the comment section. Promo code Flock is going to get you a 100% deposit match. Our rest of season fantasy football rankings at tiers. A Brock Purdy special pick of more than less than half a total yard. And a Monroe St. Brown special pick of more than less than half a total yard. That's exclusive only to code Flock users. And then a LeBron James special pick of more than less than half a total point as well. Nothing ever like it. Please make sure you take advantage. And I really hope you enjoyed it. Really hope you got something from it. And really hope I get to see you in the live stream tomorrow night.